Well, good morning to everybody and everybody online as well as our campuses. Just want to say glad you guys are here today. If you got your Bibles, go ahead and open up to Luke chapter 10. That's where we're going to be. So Luke chapter 10, we're going to start in verse 25. So if you guys got it uh, with you, go ahead and open it up. And also, if you don't mind, stand as we read God's word together. We're going to be in Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 25. And it says, And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So he said to him, being Jesus, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And so he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But desiring to justify himself, he said to Jesus, who is my neighbor? So Jesus replied, a man was going down to Jerusalem from Jericho from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side as well. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him, he bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, then he set, on, set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And then the next day he took two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. So in verse 36, Which of these three, Jesus asked, do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? So the man replied, To the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, that we get an opportunity to be together today to read your word and to uh, learn from it. So help us to do that, Father, that we would see it, we would understand it, but then we would go out and we would live it uh, in the power of your Holy Spirit. And we pray. Amen. You guys, feel free to have a seat. Thank you so much. Man, I, I just got to tell you, uh, we're starting off today, and I uh, told, the Ada, uh, told um, folks earlier that, um, man, I'm, I'm excited uh, like just about today, like just just this message, man. I've been hanging on to this for a couple of weeks now, actually more than that. And uh, I'm really more looking like to- like forward towards like the end of the message. And uh, don't say amen because I know that you'll probably be agreeing with that. So uh, just just go with it. Uh, but uh, our our message series we continue today is high impact. So we talked about last week, and we're going to continue to talk about today and the next week about how we as a church can have high impact, high amounts of influences for the sake of the gospel in our community. And so we talked about being salt and light last week and what that looks like. And so today we're going to continue our series called High Impact. And to start off, I want to share with you a story that comes from our Habersham campus. A a few weeks ago, uh, I was uh, told about this guy that goes to our Habersham campus. His name is Cleet Honeycutt. And uh, Cleet Honeycutt and some others from uh, our church, they decided to get together and to go out and to serve someone in the community and do some work alongside someone. And so they had this opportunity to work at a home and to help a lady be able to get into her bathroom because her wheelchair couldn't fit. And so they did some things around her bathroom, made it possible for her to be able to take a a bath and no longer have to receive sponge bath. And so they did that work, and uh, they were thankful for that. But what was neat about the opportunity that they had is that not too long after that, Cleet was at Walmart. And while he was at Walmart walking around, the son of the family that they had, the house that they had worked at, walked up to him and he said, hey, aren't you the guy from Concord that came with some others and helped do what you did at our house? And he said, yeah, that's us, absolutely. And so that young man went on to talk about how thankful he was and how thankful his family was that they had an opportunity to do that for his mom and how, that, and that's where I told you the story earlier about how for months that she had not been able to make it to her own bathroom to have a bath, but he explained that like you guys have now given her something that she's been praying for for a while, and the family wrote Cleet and others a note, and they said, we, the Monty family, ask God for help, and like the scripture says, ask and you shall receive, God is good, and so are the Christians that come and repaired my home, we love you as Christians, Janice, Devin, and Jerry. So it's an amazing thing. I, uh, I sent uh, Cleet a text and I said, hey, you know, you know, tell me a little bit about that. And he shared about it and just shared how it was a neat opportunity to be able to make that connection. And then not only make that connection to serve other people, but then look at the connection that they now have with that family that extends past the opportunity that they had to serve that weekend. 
And so when we choose to serve, when we choose to do that, when we're coming up in a couple of weeks with our serve weekend, that's our prayer, is that out of that weekend, not only do we, yes, fulfill the call of serving and helping and meeting needs, but that there would be further relationship for the glory of Jesus Christ following that day. And so that's the whole point of what we're doing this week um, and this month is talking about high impact, talking about stories like this and talking about what would it look like for more of this to happen in our context here in Northeast Georgia. And to do that, I want to pose to you a question, and this isn't really a question that I came up with. This is something that came out of the book Transformational Church by Ed Stetzer. But in the book, Ed Stetzer asked this question, but we made it for us this morning, is that if Concord ceased to exist, would the community even take notice? So as we're talking about high impact and high amounts of influence, and we're looking at what's going to happen in a couple of weeks and the opportunity that we're going to have, when you think about our church and our, our community of faith here, not just here in this location, but all of our other locations as well across northeast Georgia, thinking about this question, if we stopped existing today, would the community take notice? Not if this building disappeared, but if the people of Concord stopped doing what the people of Concord were doing. Would people take notice that there's less people serving? Would people take notice that there's less gospel presentation happening? Would people take notice that there's just salt and light in the area, or would things remain the same? You know, it's a humbling question to think about. To think about what does it look like for us to collectively to really um, ask this question, which I think pertains to where we're going this morning, is do we neighbor well? As a body of believers gathered under the, under the banner of Jesus Christ and entitled Concord Baptist Church collectively, do we neighbor well? So this is a question for us together, and this is a question for us individually to explore as we jump in to what I think is probably a very familiar passage of Scripture this morning, the Good Samaritan. And when I think of the Good Samaritan, I think of this joke about this Sunday school class that this lady was leading of a four-year-olds, and she was going to tell the story of the Good Samaritan. And so she wanted to be as descriptive as possible. And so she wanted the, the four-year-olds to see in their minds everything that was happening. And so as she was talking and reading the, good, the parable of the Good Samaritan to her four-year-old, she was describing what the man would have went through and how he was left bloody on the side of the road. And so she asked the question, what do you think any of you would do if you were in this situation where you saw the man on the side of the road bleeding and dying? And it was kind of hush over the crowd for a second, but then one four-year-old honest little girl raised her hand and said, I think I would throw up. But, it, it, but isn't that all of us? Like, we want to ask ourselves this question. When we're in this situation, what would we do? And what do we do? Because a lot of times, yes, we would look at that situation and go, you know what, I don't want to get in that. That makes me a little queasy. That, may, that makes me a little uneasy. I know what it's going to take for me to jump into that situation of service and what could happen because of that in my life. But I think what we're going to see this morning from Luke uh, in the story of the parable of the Good Samaritan that Jesus told to teach a point is that we're, I think we're going to be inspired to, to look past what could happen uh, in, to us and how our schedules might get wrecked and how our agendas might get messed up to really still pursue the answer. Do we, the answer to this question is, do we neighbor well? And that our community around us would answer this for us, and they would say yes. And so Luke chapter 10, verse 25 is where we start. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test. Now this wasn't a lawyer kind of like we think about in our today's terms. It's more of a lawyer of someone who was maybe in your text it actually says an expert of the law. It was someone who studied the Old Testament and they knew the Old Testament inside and out and they could tell you what the law said and what you were supposed to do and when you were supposed to do it and everything that you were supposed to carry out. And so this was someone that was very learned and also very elite when it came to Jewish social status. And so this was the guy that came to Jesus, and he wanted to ask him a question so that he could test Jesus. And the word test there, and what we understand from the text, is that he wasn't asking because he was trying to get something out of it so that he could go away and do it. He was trying to ask it from an antagonistic standpoint to trick Jesus. To put Jesus in a situation where maybe all of the people that were kind of starting to pay attention to Jesus would stop paying attention to Jesus, and then would begin to start paying attention to this guy again. And so it was an antagonistic question, a test. So he says, teacher, what should I, what must I, what can I do to inherit eternal life? What do I do in order that eternal life will be handed to me, is what the gentleman said. And so Jesus replied. He said to him, what is, what is written in the law? And how do you read it? So what Jesus was doing was affirming that him and, him and this guy were on level ground. 
Because what was written in the law, what was written in the Old Testament is, is what was final. Just like what is written in the complete word of God is final. What God has said is final. It is done. It is finished. He has spoken, therefore we must do. So Jesus said, what is written? Because whatever is written, then that's what we are to do. And so he asked the man, what is written? How do you read it? How do you interpret it? And so the man replies, he says, well, you should love the Lord your God. So he gets that from Deuteronomy. We, uh, it's known as the Shema. You love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. And then you will love your neighbor as yourself. So those two things joined together, joined together indicates that not only Jesus, but others had an understanding that the whole law was summed up in following these two things. Loving God with all your heart and loving your neighbor as yourself. And if it wasn't this guy's idea that he had gotten it from, then maybe he had heard Jesus already talk about. But regardless... They were both in agreement because what Jesus said next, you have said or you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. So according to the self-righteous pursuit of this man, he had gotten what he needed to get out of this situation so far. Because what he was seeking was self-justification. I want to make sure I'm good enough. And so when he asked, when he asked Jesus the question and then Jesus responds, you're correct in saying that you love God and you love your neighbor as yourself, then you, you said it, so you're good to go, way to go. You know, that's, if you're looking for a pat on the back, that's what the guy was getting. And if you're ever in life, and uh, I, I do this probably more than anybody, um, you get in a situation, in a conversation, and it gets to the point where you probably should just walk away and stop talking. You know, like I've learned this in marriage, that at some point in the conversation, it's best just to hush. And this is, this is that moment in, in this situation, in this text, we, you know, we don't really see it, but, but this is where, at, any, at this moment, this guy should have taken off the size 10 sandal that he was wearing and put it in his mouth and walked away. But he had to speak up. And so I would imagine, like, maybe, the, maybe Jesus was kind of like, okay, conversation's over. You know, I'm going to give this guy, you know, we're, we're kind of, maybe, and maybe Jesus was turning. Maybe, like, he was finishing, maybe going to answer someone else's question. I don't know. We can't, you know, come up with reality there. We're only left to what the text says, but... We, we do know that the man was getting what he needed, but he opened his mouth. And when he opened his mouth, desiring to justify himself, who is my neighbor? And at that moment, maybe there was a smile that came across our Savior's face, and he's like, all right, here we go. Because really, this guy wasn't really asking this question. We read it, and we see who is my neighbor, but there's actually... Two different questions that are being asked, one by the lawyer and then the other by Jesus that he's going to ask later. And so for the lawyer, what he was asking is, what must a person do to qualify that I should treat them as a neighbor? That's what he was asking. He was really getting at, like, well, how, how do you know who's living in such a way that I should treat them as a neighbor and love them? Like, what, like let, let's get at that. And before we, like, tisk tisk this guy, how many times do we act this way, Right? What, what do they have to do? What decisions should they have made in the past that would put them in the place that they now deserve my love? What do they have to look like or act like or wear or dress? Or what, what racial class should they come from in order for me to extend love for them the way that Jesus wants me to extend love from them? We have our list of qualifications as well. So let us be careful in not passing blame off to this guy and saying, oh, shame on you for asking what qualifies someone to receive your love. But that's what the lawyer was indeed asking. What must someone do? But, thi but this is what Jesus said. Jesus was asking the other question. And you're going to see it later. What must I do? This is other centered. In other words, what do they have to do to receive my love? Jesus is going to get the man to think about what must I do to be a loving neighbor? What must we do? What must you do to be a loving neighbor? And so right here in the, in, in the middle of the crowd, this man's heart is put on the dissection table. He should have just walked away, kept his mouth closed, but like right now Jesus is about to expose his heart and our heart. And he does it through a, a story. And so he says, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Because anytime he left Jerusalem, he always went down somewhere because it was on a mountain. So from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among the robbers who stripped him, and they beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest 
Someone who was a descendant of Aaron, someone who maintained the temple, someone who did sacrifices, someone who had extensive religious duty and knew all the answers. This is the guy. Now, a priest, everybody would have been like, oh, here we go. It's about to get good. Now, a priest was going down the road, and when he saw me, he passed by on the other side. And I could see people probably scratching their heads. Huh? What? This guy was supposed to stop. You're right. So then a Levite shows up. And likewise, he came to the same place, and he saw him, and he passed by on the other side as well. So you have two people considered very religious elite people in the day. They knew all the answers. They knew what to say. They knew what to do. They knew the Old Testament backwards and forwards. The two people that you would have expected to stop didn't stop. And this was brilliant on Jesus' part because Jesus loved telling stories and parables. But one of the things that's interesting is that this was kind of a, a, a storytelling trick that people would do all the time. When they wanted to teach a lesson, they would use the religious elite like priests and Levite to teach a lesson about how to live. And so at the moment, the people would have been tuned in to expect something next. Because if he's already mentioned a priest and he's already mentioned a Levite, but those two people didn't do the thing that they were supposed to do, well, then who is left? And so they're, they're probably thinking like it's some other religious elite person in the Jewish society. And then Jesus throws this out there. And he says, but a Samaritan. Now, if you've ever read the parable of the Good Samaritan, you know that this is the most unlikely of characters to have stopped. And, and it, wasn't something like a, it wasn't something like a Georgia Tech-Georgia rivalry or an Alabama-Auburn rivalry that these people had. This was racial tension that was steeped in 800 years and so these people did not like each other. They disagreed on so many things. They disagreed on where to worship God. They disagreed on how to worship God. They disagreed on who God's people were. They, like it was, it, there was, it was, it was the, the tension could be cut with a knife in this moment. There might have been people that spit on the ground at this moment in the mention of this person's name. But it's just a fictitious person. But Jesus says, but a Samaritan, as he journeyed, he came to the place where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him. So he went up to him. And he went up to him and he bound his wounds and pouring on oil and wine. And then he sat him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And then the next day, he took out his own money, two denarii, and gave them to the innkeeper saying, Take care of him and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. And then Jesus asked the question, Which of these people, which of these three, do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And we all know the answer. The question was obvious here. But Jesus was bringing it back to that question of not so much what does someone have to do to qualify to get the love that I'm going to give them, but instead what do I do to be a good neighbor? Or who, who should I consider myself to be a neighbor to? Who should I consider to be my neighbor? That was the heart of what Jesus was trying to get at. Who should I consider to be my neighbor? Jesus was answering it in the form of a parable by saying everyone. Everyone is considered a neighbor. There is no one by racial class, socioeconomic status, or by simply looking at them, do you get to decide whether or not you do not get to show compassion to them because everyone is your neighbor. And so in verse 37, when he asked the man, he said, who do you think it was? Notice that the man couldn't even say the word Samaritan. That he actually says, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. Who, sh who should you be a neighbor to? Everyone. That was, that, that's the answer there. Who was a neighbor to the person that was on the side of the road? The Samaritan man was. Now go and do likewise. Go and show compassion the same way that this person have. And so there's three things that we can take away from this. Three choices of servanthood that we need to learn from this passage and from the life of Jesus. And that is number one, that we need to choose to see the need. That just like Jesus chose to see the need of the people around him, just like he lived in a way where his eyes were open and attentive to what the need was, both physical, emotional, and spiritual, we need to choose to see the need as well. That we need to open our eyes, we need to pray, we need to be on the lookout, we need to be expecting that God would place before us an opportunity where we get to extend the love of Christ to other people, both through word and through works. So we need to choose to see the need, but then secondly, we got to choose to roll up our sleeves. And this is the hard part, because once you roll up your sleeves, you know what's going to happen. Your hands are going to get dirty. Just like the man who stopped on the side of the road, the Samaritan that stopped to help the man, he had to roll his sleeves up. He had to do something. He had to get bloody. He had to get dirty. And I would say, more than likely, number two is probably the reason that I really never have much success in jumping into serving opportunities, is because I know it's going to take rolling up my sleeves. 
It's going to get messy. And for some of you who have served before, for some of you that have poured out your own resources, your own heart, your own love, your own life to serve other people, at some point you have learned that ministry is messy. You have learned that loving others and serving them is a messy thing, but don't miss the fact that Jesus is trying to teach us that that still should not keep us from showing compassion. So we've got to roll up our sleeves, but then number three, we've got to choose to neighbor well. These are choices that we have to make. These are things that Jesus is calling us to do. Serving others is not always easy. Matter of fact, it's like really never easy. It might be easy in the moment once you get into it because you realize like God had that for you and he is empowering you to do that. But before you step into it, there is something about us in our nature that says no. And it's because we're sinful, selfish creatures. And we want everything for ourselves and everything to be about us. You know, if it, when we think about choosing to neighbor well, when it talks about Jesus in John chapter 1, that he was the word and he was in the beginning and, and he was always there. And it, Jesus wasn't created, but he was there in the beginning. And he, everything that was created was created through him and for him. And then it says later on down in John 1, it says that he then came into the world and made his dwelling among us. That word used tabernacle. He moved into the neighborhood. If Jesus was in your neighborhood, your physical neighborhood, or in our community, what kind of neighbor would Jesus be? What would Jesus do? We don't have to, we don't have to guess. We don't have to come up with these subjective reasons of like, well, he, maybe he would do this, maybe he would do that. We just got to read the word. It's not what, did, what would Jesus do, what did Jesus do? And what Jesus did was taught us to neighbor well. So we need to be willing to ask the question is, what should I do to neighbor well? And then whatever response comes into your mind, whatever Holy Spirit prompts you to move to in order to neighbor well in our community, whatever it is he prompts you to, what, to do in your neighborhood, in your home, in your business, in your school, and wherever it is you are to serve others and neighbor well, whatever you get prompted to do, my prayer is that you would step towards that. And that's the point of Serve Weekend coming up and what we're hoping to see happen is that as we answer this question what if Concord ceased to exist with the community notice? We would love for the community to be able to say a resounding yes. That they would look at Concord and if we stop doing what we stop doing, that people in the community would take notice. And that we would choose to see those needs and roll up our sleeves and that we would choose to neighbor well anyone that comes into contact with us. But there's a deep truth that we need to know about this story. Remember how I told you I was excited about the end? Well, here it comes. So you're probably saying, amen, here it comes. But really, the reality of this story is that we're not the good Samaritan. The person that pours out his life, his resources, his own power to help someone that by cultural standards is considered an enemy of the man that stopped to help him is not a picture of us. It's actually a picture of Jesus, that Jesus is the good Samaritan in this story. Let me ask you a question. What if instead we were primarily like the guy that is on the side of the road? The commission, the commission to love and neighbor well, and then our response to that, or our lack of response to that, might have something to do with how we see ourselves in this story. Let me ask you this. What do you think the expert in the law, the lawyer, what do you think he would have discovered after he heard the words, go and do this. Like if he would legitimately, because more than likely we know, like he was trying to trick Jesus. It wasn't, a, it wasn't about his heart. It was about trying to put himself in a place where people would see him as better than Jesus. And so we know he wasn't trying to make a spiritual step and take the next step in his faith, but he was trying to trick Jesus. But if, if, if he would have walked out of that situation and would have said, you know what, I'm going to go and do what Jesus said. Do you know what he would have realized? I think it's the same thing that we realize when we walk out of these doors every day, when we vacate the premises, when we leave our community groups, when we leave hanging out with other Christians and they encourage us, and then we say, you know what, let's go and do it. You know what we realize is that for us, really go and do is really a go and try. Because we get out there and we try and we try and we try again and we fail. And the reason that we fail is because we see ourselves in this story as the Good Samaritan, but in reality, it's Jesus. That what this story is really trying to teach us is that in our depravity, we don't have the ability to love well. We don't have the ability to neighbor well. That a relationship with God can never be based on human accomplishments or human works. No one can do this. No one can fulfill the law of love, of loving God and loving your neighbor well. We can't do it on our own. 
And the truth of it is that we are all in or were, currently are, whatever it is, that we all were in a ditch of our own sin, left by the side of the road to die on our own without any help whatsoever. And there was nothing we could do to crawl out of the ditch until a man stopped by, poured out his blood, poured out his life, and poured out his resources, and is offering you the hand of grace and mercy. And so this story is not about what we can do. It's more about what Jesus has already done and is allowing us to be a part of this. And yes, we have to see this. And and, and we have to neighbor well. This is an excuse for us to walk out of here and go, all right, well, don't I have to do anything? The, the, The purpose of this story is for us to see the depravity of our own condition that we would look and we would go, man, that is hard. Like, I get it. And I think Jesus got it too. More than likely, that guy walked away depressed from the situation, one, because his pride was hurt, but two, he might have come to grips with the reality that he is a sinful and depraved human being. And when I look at my life and sometimes the opportunities that I don't take to help and to serve other people, it comes because of the view I have of myself. But instead of looking at myself, I need to look to the identity of Christ. See, what Jesus was trying to teach this man is not a bunch of new rules that he needs to go and to live by, but rather he was giving him a new reality to live in. Don't go and do more. Don't go and try and do more of what you've been trying to do on your own. Stop living with the list of rules of do's and don'ts. Start living in the reality that it's already done for you, and then from that as an expression of love and gratitude because of what Jesus has done on the cross, that's how you love people. And this changes the way that we serve. This changes the way that we minister to people. We stop looking at ourselves as the hero. We, start, we, we stop looking at ourselves when we don't do things and putting ourselves down and getting into these states where we're like, well, I can't do anything or it's too many problems in the world. There's too much hurt. We stop looking at it from that standpoint and we start looking at what Jesus did on the cross and we start going, it's possible. But not only, not, it's, it's, it's possible not because of anything we have but because of what he did. It's not a bunch of new rules that Jesus came to give us. It's a new reality that he came to help us live in and to help us live out of. In 1 John 4, 19, it says, we love because he first loved us. This is the new reality. There's no rule in this. That that living and serving other people and participating in Serve Weekend or doing it across here or doing it across our communities isn't because of an expression of a bunch of new rules that we were handed on a Sunday morning. It's an expression of the new reality that Jesus is allowing you to live in. I mean, if you walk away from anything today, like just these two words is all you need. Because He. Because He lives. We can face tomorrow because He lives. Because He went to the cross. So maybe today, maybe some of you have been thinking about like being a part of Serve Weekend. Or, you know, maybe you're thinking about getting involved. We would love that you would get involved. But not because we're asking or not because you feel guilted into it, but that that you would go back to this. Because he, because he has done something amazing in your life. And maybe some, and maybe, just maybe, as we start seeing what Jesus has done for us, it will then compel us to actually go out and to serve in the same manner with which he served us. So because he, because he, we can. We can live in a new reality, serving and loving others around us. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus. Your gospel is so good that you would love a sinner, a sinner like me, That you would die on a cross. That just like all of us in the room, we were once in the ditch of our own sin. Left to to our own demise. But you and your grace and your mercy decided to, to come down and to live with us. And to take on our sin and our shame. Heads bowed, eyes closed. That's what Jesus did for you. Each each one of us in the room were left to our own demise and our own sin, separated from God for all of eternity, hanging on to our sin, walking towards our death. But Jesus took your sin on the cross. He died your death and then was raised from the dead to prove that he had the power over sin and death in your life. And this morning, maybe what you need to do is you need to wake up and realize maybe the Holy Spirit is 
moving in your heart for the first time and he is bringing you out of death into life he is pulling you out of the ditch and he is setting you back he is setting you on the path to follow him the Bible says if you would just repent from your sin and turn and follow him you have new life confess it with your mouth believe in your heart so if you're here this morning or you're online or across one of our campuses and you want to make that decision we would love to celebrate that with you we're gonna have a time of invitation We'd love to talk about what that looks like. Don't be afraid to come down. Don't be afraid to talk about how you know you need to come out of the ditch. But also if you're here today and you've been thinking about joining our church, partnering with us in ministry, we'd love to talk to you about that as well to make that decision. So all across the room, if y'all will, we're going to stand and close in a word of, uh, in a word of prayer and then another song. So Jesus, uh, we pray that you be blessed and honored in all that we say, all that we do. In your name we pray. Amen.